You know, Steve, the only move after that is to smash your guitar on the stage or something. <laughs> I want to be there for that one. Yeah, that'll be great. My name is John Evans. In addition to being an elder here, I have the honor and privilege of uh, serving and supporting 400 chaplains who serve in jails and prisons around the world, 25 countries, 22 states here in the U.S. Uh, organization has been in existence since 1961. It was founded in Fairfax County, and in Maryland we have full-time chaplains, Anne Arundel, PG, Montgomery, Carroll Counties, close by York, Pennsylvania, and Northern Virginia we have them in Arlington, Fairfax, and Prince William. These are men and women who go in on a daily basis and minister to spiritual needs of inmates um, here and abroad. And so it's uh, my honor to speak here during our missions week, an annual event. Um, we had a potluck last night, and I know potlucks are old school, right? So some of you grew up with potlucks, and most churches these days don't know how to do it, all right? So you go there, and you're like, okay, well, there's some Kentucky Fried Chicken or um, uh, Royal Farms Chicken, and, you know, and you're just kind of in some pizza. No, this church still knows how to do it, so if you missed it, you missed it, right? Uh, Pastor Steve was bragging about his Peruvian pile of goo or whatever it was called that he had, <laughs> and, and he brought it, and um, everybody was looking for chicken, and he said, no, that's peasant food, man. This has got beef in it, so anyways, um, you missed it. It is a little odd. I do have to admit, I told the first service, it's a little odd to eat uh, Chinese dumplings with baked beans, right? It doesn't really kind of go, but hey. If you weren't there, you missed it. So next time there's a potluck, I encourage you to show up. It's a good idea. Um, Steve mentioned that uh, this month we have a series of, of Sundays devoted to really launching points, starting points. And uh, with Missions Week, one of our launch point actions is uh, this card. They're back there on the table. There's about 87 different things to sign up for in the lobby this morning. So if you can find this, it's there. There are uh, cards for every one of our missionaries that we support, their name, their uh, address, their uh, email, where they serve, what they do. And our challenge is for each family or individual to take one of these, commit to pray for these individuals for a period of a year, communicate with them, find out what they do, have them tell you about their ministry, get involved with them first through prayer. There may be other needs that you can meet. Um, but if you would grab those, I'm sure um, we'll have these available until they're all gone. And once they're all gone, we'll probably make more. So anyways, you can grab one. And uh, that's what we're after in terms of our launching point in praying for missionaries. If you do pick up one, do sign up for it. And that isn't because somebody's going to hound you about praying. Uh, we just want to make sure that all the missionaries are covered. So we want to make sure that we've got those. So pick up one of these cards. That'll be great. Uh, one other item. Um, display of our ministries out there. Feel free to take all the literature that's there. We love to give it away. We love for you to have it. Um, if you'd like to go on a missions trip on October 17th to a third world country, it'll take you two hours. You don't have to get on an airplane. Uh, we are uh, providing a look behind the walls, a tour of Ordnance Road Correctional Center, one of our two local jails, love to have you join us, need you to sign up for that. We'll get in touch. If we have too many for that night, we'll work out another opportunity. Um, so do sign up. Men and women are welcome, okay? It's not just for, for men. Um, but it gives you a glimpse. If you've never been to jail on either side of the bars, it gives you an opportunity to see what uh, happens there and hear a little bit about the ministry that we have. We also have, for goodness, sounds like a bunch of commercials. I'm sorry. Um, we have a golf event coming up on October 12th. If you're a golfer and like to join us, sign up there. We'll send you information and love to have you uh, be a part of that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Father, thank you for all that you've given us. Salvation that we don't deserve. A place in this country that we've not earned. Opportunity to hear your word that many others will never have. And so we trust that with what you've entrusted to us, we might be good stewards, we might respond to your word. So lead us today as we look at the scriptures and we think about those all around us that have been forgotten. And may you guide us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. A good missions message does not begin without statistics. Right? Good mission speaker, give you statistics. So let's cover the major religions of the world briefly. Animism, that's not just the worship of animals, it's worship of inanimate objects, water, rocks, trees, the sun, 
200 million people think that that's the source for them. Hinduism has a billion. Islam has a billion and a half. Buddhism, 600 million. Christians, in quotes, 2 billion. But that includes everybody that is even close, right? That would be Protestants, it'd be Catholics, it'd be Mormons, it'd be Jehovah's Witness, the whole schmear of them. Only of about a quarter of those, 500 billion, give or take, would be able to tell you about Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, the only salvation from sin. So the modern missionary evangelical movement then divides people into people groups, all right? And so, go ahead, Larry, the next slide. The people groups we start with are the unreached people groups. 4.3 billion people on the planet have no indigenous church. What we mean by that is a Christian church, a Bible-believing church in their neighborhood or that they could connect with. The unevangelized are people who have access to the gospel, but they've never heard the message. Those are people who live near us, live in our neighborhoods. Then there's the unchurched, 75% of the globe doesn't go to any church of any kind, of any religion at all. There are the unengaged, this is 220 million people for whom there does not appear to be a plan to bring the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ to them in their language. Nobody has figured out even a thought about how to reach them. And then we get to the unwanted people, and these are the people that we're talking about this morning. We're referring to them as forgotten peoples. Peoples that tend to be marginalized in society, and what was true 2,000 years ago is true today. Turn with me to Matthew 25. That's where we're going to begin. Because Christ identifies at the end of the age who these people are and the special place in his heart that he has for them. Matthew 25, let me give you the context. Jesus is talking about the end of days, the end of time, and his reminder in the first 30 verses is you need to be prepared. He tells the parable or the story of 10 virgins waiting for the bridegroom, and they've got their oil ready, and the problem is the bridegroom doesn't show up when they're hoping, and some of them have to run home and get more oil. Well, while they're gone, the bridegroom comes, and they miss out. So they weren't prepared. And then he goes to the next parable, parable of the talents, a little bit more famous. Rich man, he's got three servants, brings them in, says, going on a trip. Give one guy five talents, one guy three talents, one guy one talent. And says, now go and do something with it. And when he comes back, he calls them in to account for what they've done with what he's given them. Listen to a message last week in the car where a preacher said that this is the biblical instruction to diversify your portfolio. And as Dave Cole might say, I don't think that means what you think it means. That is not what this verse is about. This passage about the talents is not about wealth management. It's about the reality that the Lord is going to return and he's going to look at us and say, what did you do with what I gave you, what I told you, what you knew and what you had? It's about accountability. And the question will be, will we be found faithful, not will we be found wealthy? So, Matthew 25, verse 31, we read, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger, invite you in, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these, my brethren, even the least of them, the forgotten, you did it to me. Verse 41, he continues, then he will say to those on his left, these are the goats, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. A stranger, you did not invite me. And naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. 
And they themselves will answer, Lord, well, when did we see you, hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, or in prison, and not take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. So recapping, the scene is before the throne of God, the judgment. All nations, it says in verse 32, will be there. They'll be separated. There'll be the goats and there'll be the sheep. That's it. Those are the only two groups. And the sheep are the believers, the people who've put their faith and trust in Christ, and the goats are everybody else. And the king says to the sheep, come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Here's your reward. But then he continues on. And he says, for I was hungry, verse 35, you gave me something to eat, thirsty, you gave me something to drink, I was a stranger, you invited me in naked, you clothed me sick, you visited me in prison, you came to me. Now, some might suggest in reading this passage that this is how the sheep earn their way to heaven, earn their way to salvation, right? You take care of the people in need, and then God will respond, and he'll put you in heaven, But this is not the case. And the reason we know that is, first of all, that doesn't agree with Scripture. Titus 3, 5 says, It's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to the mercy of God that we're saved. And then in Ephesians, he says, It's salvation comes by grace alone, a gift of God, through faith alone, our response, in Christ alone, the perfect sacrifice. So that suggests that isn't what this verse means. And then we also note that It's interesting, the sheep are surprised, right? They're like, oh, really, Lord? This this was important? Or it it isn't like they had a checklist of requirements that they were meeting, thinking that that was going to earn them salvation. Rather, it was a reflection of the faith that they had. And they asked, Lord, when did we see you like this? We don't remember seeing you in these conditions. And the king said, to the extent you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. These are the people the unwanted, the forgotten of the world, the people who hold, for some reason, a very special place in the heart of God. They're the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, the naked, the stranger, and the prisoner. And Jesus said, when you touch the lives of these people with these extreme needs, you are ministering to me, Jesus Christ, in a special way. He holds these people dear. Now, I don't understand all the theology of that. I'll admit it. But we do recognize that when Christ was on earth, he spent a lot of time with these people. He actually liked being with these people. It wasn't the Pharisees that he enjoyed. He liked the undesirables because he came to reach the lost, to seek and to save those who had a need. And so he's saying here, if you're a true follower of me, You care about these people. I noticed something about these groups of people about six or seven months ago. Five of the sick, hungry, thirsty, sick, naked, alone, maybe that's the homeless people. Five of them, more often than not, are innocent. Meaning they may not have done anything to end up in the condition in which they find themselves. But then he throws in the prisoner who normally is guilty of something. By and large, are guilty of something. So God says, I care about these people, that you know what? A lot of people might care about them, but I also care about the prisoner, a person that most people would rather forget. And he includes them in there. So how many of these people are in the world? Well, let's give you some more statistics real quick. All right? Total population of the world, 7.5 Billion, the United States, 325 million, Anne Arundel County, 570,000. They say that 795 million people in the world suffer daily from hunger. And even in the United States, 49 million are undernourished, malnourished, or, or uh, suffer from uh, food insecurity. And what that means is they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And even in our county, almost 10% of the population is food insecure. They don't know where their next meal will come. Water, 783 million people in the world do not have access to clean water. Five million will die every year because of that. That's not a big problem where we live. Sick, 400 million in the world lack essential adequate care. That's, again, not a huge problem in our neighborhood in terms of physical needs, but recognize the reality in the United States that one out of 25 adults, one out of 25 suffers from a debilitating or impactful mental issue or condition. One out of 25. 
Naked, well, there's a billion children who live in poverty. 15 million here in the United States. There's 4,500 of them here in Anne Arundel County who live below the poverty line. That means a family of four makes less than $24,000 a year. I wouldn't know how you live off, off of that. Stranger. I'm going to suggest these are homeless people. 100 million in the world, 1.6 billion do not have adequate housing. Even in our county, there's 400 homeless. Baltimore City, just up the street, another 2,500. And then the prisoner, 10 million in the world. 2.1 million in the United States. We win on this one. We're really, really good at it. We know how to lock people up. In our county, actually, daily population, population this morning is in the 800 range in the two facilities here in Anne Arundel County, but 10,000 inmates will pass through those facilities this year. 10,000. The people in need are all around us. The forgotten people are right here. And they're in great need. And they're looking for answers. You see, the challenge of most average people is that They've got an average income and they live in average housing and they've got average kids and go to at least decent or above average schools. And so they don't have the felt need that these people have because it seems like it's going okay. Dare I say we think we are blessed. And what I mean by that is for some reason we think there's a spiritual tie to what we have. And so that must mean we must be doing something right. And I'm not sure that that's the case. But Jesus said, take a look around you. Look all around you because you're going to see these people. When you look, you will see them. When you look at the people, you will see hungry and thirsty. And it may not be physical food. It may be spiritual. You'll see people who are sick and sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you'll see people who are alone. And you'll see strangers and people who are homeless. And you'll see people sitting in jail. And you'll see people who have friends and relatives sitting in jail. And perhaps what Jesus is saying is this is the group of people who is most likely to respond to the gospel because they have a felt need. Our chaplains will have access. We have 400 chaplains scattered across the globe. will have access to between a million and a half and two million inmates this year in the facilities in which we serve. That means if the inmate cares to hear the gospel, speak to someone about spiritual things, receive a Bible, that opportunity is afforded to them. And as a result, we'll see somewhere between 40 and 60,000 inmates who will make a decision to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I've had people say, well, that's an amazing number, over 2 million in the last 30 years. Why is that? Is it because, because our chaplains are so good? No, it's because inmates are acutely aware of the implications of their behavior. They look at themselves and go, it's not going so good. So whether you're in Ordnance Road or Jennifer Road or in a prison in Zambia, they look at where they are, and in their heart of hearts, if they're paying attention, they realize, wow, this is not going according to the plan. Maybe I need a different plan. And they're open to hear the good news. I want to show you a brief video. During the 1994 genocide, I lost 12 close family members. I learned how my sisters were killed they were burnt alive. My cousins and my brothers, they were beaten to death. We thought even God uh, had forgotten our country and our people. This is a man who has every right to be angry at the world, to be angry at God, but he decided that he would seek healing. When I was one day in prayer, I had a, a voice telling me, if you want to keep serving me, you have to forgive those people uh, who have killed your people, the people who have made so many people orphans and widows. I, I couldn't forgive them. As we seek the Lord in prayer, 
He transforms our hearts. And we begin to see the world more as he does. I began to pray for those people. If you want to forgive someone, you just start praying for him. As you pray for him, you, you will feel uh, uh, mercy and forgiveness coming up in your heart. God gave Pius a passion for taking the truth to the prisoners of this country. And now he leads a ministry that has 11 chaplains working in 11 different prisons. We could see uh, so many people coming to the Lord. And uh, uh, the prisoners could not believe uh, the, the, uh, the motivating influence uh, which was behind us, pushing us to go to prison and preach the gospel. They've led thousands of people to a life-changing connection with Jesus. And it happened because Pius was obedient to the call that God gave him for his life. Forgotten people matter to God. So Pius Nayakiro is our director in Rwanda of Good News Rwanda, and he leads a team of chaplains ministering to inmates. Every one of our chaplains has come face to face and shared the gospel with someone responsible for the death of an immediate family member in the genocide. I don't know how to do that. J.D. Greer's pastor of Summit Church was speaking at a conference I was at uh, back in January, and he said this, and I think it articulates the obstacle that we have in our way. He says, we care so much about things that matter so little, and we care so little about things that matter so much. Care so much about things that matter so little, and we care so little about things that matter so much. That's our obstacle. That's my obstacle. Put a lot of time and energy into things that have no eternal value, and then we apply so little attention to things that matter most and matter for eternity. And then we wonder why it's all so messed up. So I'd say we have a heart problem. I have a heart problem. We have a love problem. We love the things of the world at times a whole lot more than we love God. Look at our lifestyles. Look at our checkbooks. Look at our credit card statements. Look at our calendars, and you see it. We're stuck. We're, we're chasing the next entertainment, the next convenience, the next luxury while the world around us is desperate for Christ. So where do we start overcoming this obstacle? Where do we begin to get back on track? Let's allow Jesus to teach us. Turn back to Matthew 22. And hear what Jesus had to say about how it is we might be useful for his purposes to reach the lost, bring hope to the forgotten. In Matthew 22, Jesus is being challenged by the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're poking at him. They're asking him questions. They're not looking for answers to questions. They're looking for opportunity to trip him up, to catch him, to snag him in some way. It wasn't working out very well, so they bring in a lawyer. Nothing against lawyers, Brother Dave. Uh, verse 35, Matthew 22. One of them, a lawyer, asked a question, testing him. He says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? In the law, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Well, that's it. It's as simple as that. Hey, simple as what? Just do that. Just love the Lord and love your neighbor. It's, that's all God wants us to do. And according to verse 40, that's the essence of the whole thing. The gospel, the scriptures, God's entire message. God says, love me and then love your neighbor. I adopted a phrase years ago when I was discovering these simple things in scripture. It's that simple, but it's not that easy. So we're in missions action week. So how do we do this thing that is not so easy, that is to love God and love others? Well, first we have to define what love is. Love is putting the rights, needs, interests, and desires of someone else above ourselves. Again, the rights, needs, interests, and desires of someone else above ourselves. Love is not a feeling, it is always an action, and it always requires that we give up self. Always. 
So when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, he's talking about giving up self. Not a part of it, all of it. That's why I use those, just that description. Heart, soul, mind, and other passages he uses and adds strength. But that's the essence of it. My rights, my passions, my desires, my plans, my agenda are all replaced with him. I follow his direction. I follow his word. I follow him in all things. That's what loving God with all you have involves. Because without a love for God, there is no love for others. Without a love for God, there's no way that I can see others the way he sees them. Because until my love for God exceeds my love for myself, there is no loving anybody else. So love with our entire being being so that we can show love. So that we can reach others. The forgotten in particular, the unwanted even in our neighborhood. So how do we do that? Let me suggest here's how we love the forgotten. Number one, look at them with compassion. Steve read from Matthew 9, Jesus was moved with compassion. That's how he operated. Let me tell you how I normally operate. I grew up in a fairly critical and cynical home. I know that's hard for most of you to believe, particularly those that know me. Um, but I start from the, what's wrong with these people? Hey? That's what I say to our 14-year-old regularly. What is wrong with you? Hey? And when I see people in desperate situations, I'm running through the logical progression likely they went through to get where they were. Perhaps a better question is, I wonder what happened to these people. I wonder what happened to these people. 97% of women who are behind bars in the United States and behind bars in the U.S., about 340,000 women are locked up, local, state, and federal. 97% of them have been physically or sexually traumatized and abused. 97%. So we're learning to ask the question, what happened to this person? It doesn't justify the behavior, but it'll explain a lot. A great opening line with hurting people is to ask them, tell me your story. And you'd be amazed at what kind of floodgates that'll open. Everybody has a story. And when we learn from people about their story, may we be reminded that but for the grace of God, that might be us. Look at them as Christ does. Secondly, overlook their life situation. When we minister to inmates, it's very easy to say, well, they're getting what they deserve. Or we could even quote scripture. Reap what you sow. Or I hope he or she learns their lesson this time. But maybe Christ wants us to ignore their life situation. Because the truth is, there's nothing you can do about what's already happened, right? Don't cry over spilt milk. It's a pretty simple concept, but there's nothing you can do about that. And the truth is, even moving forward, when you look at life situation, there may be very little you can do about that. We look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So maybe we ought to start there, too, and look at the heart situation and say, well, this is where we are. Where can we go from here? Overlook the life situation. Number three, let them view the love of Christ through you. Date yourself. How many of you remember the musical group, The Imperials, 1970s Southern Gospel? A whole lot more in this service. Nobody wanted to admit it in the first service. <laughs> so they had a song that they wrote, others may have wrote, uh, that they sang, others may have sung it, don't know who wrote it. It's called, You're the Only Jesus, and these are the words to the song. It says, You're the only Jesus some will ever see. You're the only words of life some will ever read, so let them see in you the one in whom is all they'll ever need. Because you're the only Jesus some will ever see. And if not you, I wonder who will show them love. And love alone can make things new. 
If not from you, how will they learn? Let them view the love of Christ through us. And finally, think eternally. If we were to go back to Matthew 25 and look at verse 41, we'll see that the judgment is real, that hell is real. Jesus isn't just painting a nice story that says, you know, there's nice people in the world and not so nice people in the world. No, he says there's a truth to judgment. There's going to be the the believer and the unbeliever. And the believer, he will say, enter into my heaven. And to everybody else, he will say, separation, the consequences of sin. There are no second chances. There are no do-overs once this life has ended. And we have the answer. If we're followers of Christ, we have the answer. So may we get our eyes off of our today and help others see their need for eternity. Christ is who they need. Think eternally. June 15th of this year, received an email from our Good News Director in Nigeria. His name is Nisibiat. With a partner organization, a Good News in the organization raised money to provide a generator to Calabar Prison in Nigeria to power a well to provide water. The old generator had died, and they were living without. The night before the dedication of the generator, Nisibiat writes this. He says, last night was a terrible one. Thieves broke into our house, did many terrible things. They came in around 1.30 a.m., demanded money. In fact, I had very little. I had saved 150 U.S. dollars, but I was saving that in order to take my mother-in-law to a better hospital for medical treatment. I gave it to them, yet they demanded more, but that was all I had. After severe beatings on me and my wife, they went into my bedroom, took the computer, they took the printer, they took the phones in the house, and they left. Early this morning, I rushed and took my wife to the hospital for medical care and my mother-in-law as well. They didn't lay hands on the children. Be praying for me. This is my first experience of this situation. So when we get that kind of information, three children, I think all under the age of seven, how traumatic for them. How badly were they hurt? What can we do to help? And even find ourselves saying, well, God, why would you let this happen to this guy? This guy loves inmates. Let me tell you what Nasibiot's response was. He says, if you don't hear from me as usual, continuing the email, this is the situation with me. I will still be going to Calabar Prison tomorrow for the dedication of the generator so that the inmates can have water. This occasion has been scheduled, and as long as there is life, I must go to the prison for this function. Keep me and my family in your prayers, please, Nasibiot. Why would he do that? Let me suggest because he loves the Lord. And he loves others more than himself. So what happened to the dedication? Well, it was a great celebration. 72 inmates and seven prison staff, excuse me, and six prison staff gave their lives to Christ. And one inmate wrote this as his testimony. He says, this generator project inspired me to turn to a new life. I surrendered my life to Christ today, 16 June 2017. Truly God loves me, wants me to change my life's value and perspective, and so I will. May God bless the man who willingly allowed himself to be used by God to carry away the problem, water, that we have been suffering through. In a minute, I'm going to pray. When I'm done praying, we're going to show you another testimony of another inmate. When that video is complete, you'll be free to go. Reaching the forgotten. Our calling this morning, I believe, is to love God and love people. And our direction is to touch the lives of those that many have forgotten and most would rather forget. Let's pray. Father, we trust that you'll open our eyes. Help us to see those around us in need. 
And even if their need is not physical, we know that they have a spiritual need, a need to know Christ. Challenge us to love them. But may we love you first and ourselves last. For it's your name we pray. Amen. After 60 days of being in here, the state elevated my first degree charge to capital murder. I was now facing the death penalty. In my mind, at 21 years of age, I was pretty scared and pissed off at the world. So I was broken and I was gonna commit suicide. I wasn't gonna play around with it. I knew how to do it. I had already seen a couple of dudes commit suicide in here by that time. So I knew how to do it and get it done with without being caught. And I was gonna do it. But for some reason, I decided to to pray to God. But I did have a sense that there was something greater than me out there. And just in case he is real and was real, I decided to pray to him that night. And I asked God, I said, Father, God, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you exist, I don't know if you're real, but I'm gonna commit suicide in the morning if you don't show to me that you do exist, if you don't give me a sign. I felt peaceful after that. That kind of like, you know, this is it, you know, I wake up in the morning and this is gonna be it. So I fell asleep and I woke up, but I did ask him for the sign. I asked him to put an extra orange in my breakfast sack for a sign. The breakfast sacks consist of one loaf, one or two pieces of bread, a peanut butter, an orange, a milk, which is a half pint, and a cereal bowl about the same size. That's it. It's in a little brown sack at lunch. In isolation, they search your sacks thoroughly because in isolation is where they put gang members, it's where they put violent people who can't be around other people. So in the morning I woke up and the officer was getting ready to hand out sacks in the morning and the officer that was handing out sacks just happened to be the one officer that I had the most problems with. I can say that I hated him at that time. If my door would have opened up miraculously, I would have reached out and tried to hurt him. I just did not like him at all. I remember watching him going through the sacks, searching them, searched all ten of them, and he started handing them out. He started on my sack first, my cell door, which is 601. And he put my sack on the trap door. And I remember reaching out trying to grab it to pull it in. And I couldn't fit it through the trap door. And it it's just, it made me irate. It pissed me off so much because I thought he shook it up. So when I finally got it through, it felt really heavy for some reason. So I took it and I dumped it out of my bed. And to my amazement, when I, when I dumped it out of my bed, there was two of everything. There was two milks, there was two cereals, there was two breads, two peanut butters, two spoons, but one orange. And I remember sitting there looking at it in shock, and my prayer the night before it just slammed home to me. Finally, I read the book and thought it was amazing. Jonathan pulled me out one time, talked to me about Jesus Christ and God and so forth. And everything just started falling into place, like right off the bat. Like I would leave here and go in the pod, and one of my friends or acquaintance at that time would start talking to me about Jesus Christ. He was a, he was a leader for the skinheads, and he had just given up his life to Jesus Christ. That opened my eyes too, that someone of that caliber can accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe there was something real to this. Maybe there was something true to all this. A few months before 2013, I started talking to the chaplain a lot and a couple other officers who work here, and they started preaching to me about who Jesus was. And I finally, I finally turned my life over to Jesus.